everybody, and thank you very much for coming to our presentation called Drupal Project Estimation for Fun and Profit here at Drupal North. We've got myself, Alex Berkachev, uh, my colleagues, Franz uh, and Ken. Uh, Franz is a Drupal architect, solutions architect, and, and Ken is our very senior project manager who's, who's believe it or not, has done bigger projects than, than Drupal. Uh, and uh, so I already mentioned a little bit that we're Evolving Web is based in Montreal. We love events and we love hosting cool people. And we work with fancy looking logos. <laughs> so here, here's the three of us. Uh, yeah, and uh, I've been doing Drupal since well, pretty much the start of my career after, after McGill for over, over 10 years. Uh, France, I think, almost as long. 10 years. Yeah, and he comes from FFW, a small Drupal shop uh, all over the world. And, uh, <laughs> Ken kind of has been doing agency agency work for uh, a better part of a decade as well, maybe more, and uh, most probably at Twist Image, which yep. is new in Leger. And Leger Market. Uh, so a little bit about software estimation. Uh, we cribbed about half this talk from, from this book that I, that I picked up. It's kind of a classic in the software engineering circles. If you have a like, software engineering degree, they'll probably talk about either this book or Steve McConnell's book, uh, Code Complete. And uh, it's got a picture of that Microsoft keyboard on it. And uh, so these are really like the Bible. Uh, I didn't read all of it, but at least two thirds, and it has a lot of great examples. And uh, the, first, uh, the first concept that you have to take away from, from reading this book is that when people talk about software estimation, there's actually several distinct senses. When somebody says, hey, I need an estimate for how long uh, this project is going to take. So an estimate could be uh, a business target. You know, the, the sales guy says, well, the client is going to go for it if you can do it in uh, you know, 50000 bucks or 500000 bucks because that's what the client wants to hear. Uh, another thing an estimate is an unbiased uh, uh, definition of, you know, sorry, it's, a, it's an unbiased uh, idea. Well, how long do we think it's going to take, actually, if you ask a dev who's going to do it? And then a third one, and this is more on the project manager, is uh, it's a commitment. It's a, it's a commitment to, uh, to do this thing. It's a promise to the team and everyone, the client, that it's going to take that long. Now, it's very clear that the same thing, an estimate, often a single number, when it has these three conflicting goals and, and stakeholders, it, it's quite tricky to figure out what, what are we actually talking about and what are we producing. And, and this uh, duality or whatever uh, multifaceted nature of what an estimate is, is often responsible for why projects go over budget, you know. We said it would take a thousand hours, but is that what we wanted it to take, rather than what we thought it was actually going to take? Uh, so this is, uh, this is an idea that you need to be mindful. Um, so to make things a little bit smoother, it's important to, to, to realize, are we talking about a preliminary estimate, uh, or are you talking about a commitment, saying, I'm going to do this? And, uh, and it also really helps if both the client and, and, the, and the person who's giving the estimate are, are mature about the process and about what they're talking about and what they expect from each other. It also is very important they have good trust each other. Like, you know, I presume that uh, I want to make as much money as possible, right? But I don't want to do it on this project. I want to do it over the course of my career as, as a vendor. So I want to build a, a successful project. I want a happy client. I want, I want the client to, to come away feeling that they got what they came in for. Uh, so it shouldn't be seen as a, as a negotiation that's winner and loser. It should be seen as both parties are trying to get a sophisticated uh, arrangement that, that respects the goals and, and uh, constraints of both parties. So uh, I think I think that's a that's a really big uh, part of it. So another idea that we that we uh, we try to to do here is uh, come up with a few ways of, of defining an estimate. Uh, this book talks about top-down versus bottom-up, and this is something that we practice at Evolving Web all the time. So, uh, for, for the top-down, it's, it's kind of saying, well, what's the project budget? What do we think it is? You know, what kind of projects do we do? What does it look like? Does it look similar to other projects that we've done? Um, how many people are going to work on it? Like, you know, like, you know, it seems like a three-dev project, and it seems like a... It's going to have, be at least a year long. So this is this is the top-down approach, and uh, and it's very uh, it's very useful because you actually when you're doing projects that are similar to what you've done before, you can just kind of compare. And then there's the bottom-up approach, which is that you start listing all of the deliverables, uh, all of the all the phases of the project, which includes 
uh, discovery, content strategy, UI design, UX design, however many meetings you're going to have for that, which reports you're going to produce or slideshows you're going to do. You're going to include a kickoff meeting and, and how many people will be, will be present. Uh, and then, of course, you're going to start uh, breaking things down, the, the development, which is, I would, in my intuition, for Drupal projects, about 60 to 70 percent of the, of, the, of the budget goes to that. But in some projects, especially design-oriented ones, it may be lower. But you're going to break that up into sprints. You're going to break it up into phases. Uh, and you're going to say, well, in this phase, we're going to tackle these things. And, and, and we think this phase should have three sprints of two weeks each. And uh, you know, the deliverables in the first sprint will be this. The second sprint will be this. The third sprint, sprint will be this. And then you account for the QA, documentation, demos, project management that go into every sprint. So that's more the, the, the bottom, bottom up approach. Uh, do you guys know which is better? What's, uh, what's the better approach for estimation? It depends. It depends. That's, that's one answer. A better one uh, <laughs> is both are necessary. So it's kind of like uh, in, in math, when I say math, uh, they talk, uh, when you're doing logical and mathematical proofs, they talk about forward-backwards technique. You, you, know, you start with the assumptions, and then you try to derive some knowledge from it. But very often, you already have an intuition that you want to prove, like the thing you're trying to prove. So you actually start with the end. And, and then you work backwards and say, well, uh, if, it, if it was not the case, for example, is it a logical tautology? So that's proof uh, reductio ad absurdum. And that's a very important uh, class of proofs that for things that cannot be proved otherwise. So you, in, in math, mathematical proofs, you have to work forwards and backwards and see which one leads you to the proof. That's, that's how mathematicians do it. And it's the same thing with estimation. You have to do both uh, a list, uh, uh, you know, a, a list of everything that you know about but then you also have to say, well, based on what this project feels like and what I've done before and what this client is used to doing before, historically, what, is it, what does it feel like? And then you do both. Uh, and then you reconcile them. And then you reconcile it to the, to the salesperson's goals and then you can reconcile it to the client's budget. And all of those things will end up being a single magical number, an estimate. It looks very easy. Uh, yeah. <laughs> another, another important uh, technique that goes uh, hand in hand with uh, top down or bottom up is, uh, is, is this, these three estimation approaches that uh, Steve McConnell talks about, count, compute, and judge. So this is, this is judge obviously is uh, the gut, it's the intuition, it's the like, ah, I, I often do this, like people, my coworkers hate it when I say it, but I've been doing this for 11 years, I've, I've done like 100 Drupal projects now, some bigger, some smaller, and this feels like this size. And, uh, and people are like, why, why are you doing that? But actually, I'm, I'm, I like to think I'm pretty good, but I know. <laughs> uh, so, so Steve McConnell says that you should, we always use judging all the time, but you shouldn't. In fact, you should use it as a last resort or as a way to check things. And if possible, you should uh, resort to more scientific and systematic approaches. So uh, one is count. One count that I do for every new project that comes in is I go to, on Google and I go to site, for if they have an existing website, that is. I go to site, uh, myclientdomain.com, and I just see how many results Google returns. And then, That's not working very good recently. They've changed it so that now it's more of an estimate uh, instead of a count, but, uh, but nonetheless, it's still a very useful index. Uh, it'll tell you if it's a 50-page site, a 500-page site, a 50,000-page site, although beyond a couple of thousand, it stops being accurate, so that you could be factor more. Uh, we also have a crawler that we sometimes use for these things, and there's other tools, but, uh, but, it, but this Google thing, it takes one second, and there's no excuse not to do it. Uh, another, another thing that you can do often, even without access to the back end of a, of a site, is you can, you can say, how many content types do you guys have? How many languages? Uh, how many modules contributed and custom? Uh, we ask this to our clients when we, we do estimation, even if they won't give us the code. Uh, we'll say, well, okay, how many lines of custom code do you have? Uh, or I can, I can ask them, uh, okay, you want us to rebuild a Drupal 7 site onto Drupal 8, which is very common these days. How, how much of a budget and time did it take you guys to do it? Often they don't trust you, especially if they don't know you, so they won't tell you their budget or time. But you can ask them proxies for these things. You can say, which agency worked on it? How many months did it take? How many members of your team worked on this thing? How many admins do you have who are going to enter the, the content? How many new pieces of content that, you, uh, that you're going to get? Did you notice I drank a cup of coffee? Uh, so, so this is the kind of counts that we're talking about, that when you do all of these things for, for a given project, and you do them for the previous project, and you'll know by this metric or by that metric, is it bigger, is it smaller, is it roughly the same? And, and this allows you to, to index and have a common language with your coworkers as well, with your client, and explain why, why it's like this. Um, 
compute, computing uh, refers to using these counts and uh, with historical data. So at Evolving Web, uh, as of about a year and a half ago, we've gotten fairly religious uh, for logging time in, in our time tracker, which is uh, Toggle and then Redmine for our project management tools. It's automatically synced, thanks to the work of Jigar, our coworker. And, uh, and so we get to look at the previous projects that seem the same according to those indexes, and then say, well, that one took 1,500 hours, even though we only estimated 1,200. Or that one took 400, it was fine. So this, this is what it means uh, to check your, uh, check your judgment using uh, metrics. And another, another thing that I want to tell you, uh, we do, I do all the time, is, uh, is value-based pricing. I, I didn't do it uh, explicitly before, because uh, when we were in the smaller budget range and the clients would come to us asking for many, many things, uh, basically, uh, uh, like I was just saying, well, I, if I have to do all those things, it'll cost way more than I know what their budget is. So I was really sticking with the, the, the bottom-up approach and then working backwards to say, this is what's included, this is what's included, because I know that's, that's the thing. Uh, now that we are, our brand is a little bit better and we kind of have a target, target market and target price range that we, uh, that we already know, uh, that we make exceptions for, but you know we, we know what kind of projects we're good at and, we, and are successful financially for us. We sort of stick to that when it's a good fit for the client. You know, we look for clients that are a good fit for our deliverables, and then we talk to our potential clients and say, "Here's what we did for this other client that that was great, and uh, and here's roughly what that looks like in terms of price." And uh, and actually, a lot of my competitors are doing that. You know, when like I'm uh, I'm a developer first and. and have become uh, like a estimator and, and salesperson, but many many organizations have just salespeople who know nothing about Drupal development, who don't know uh, what a content type is. So how do they, how do they how do they price it? Well, they pick a number that's the the most that they think the client will pay, and what they know is the client's budget. A lot of nonprofits actually publish their their last five years of annual reports, which if you look carefully, you can glean between the lines what their budget was on IT spending, on marketing spending. Uh, and also, they'll know who the competitors are and how much they charge for something like this. So, value-based pricing is a, is a really big part of part of that. And when you come back to estimation as those three different things, uh, this this makes a lot of sense. Um, I have uh, I have a slide here. Oh yeah, yeah. So we want to to point out that. Uh, in addition to top-down and bottom-up, there's different ways of doing bottom-up, right? There could be a list of deliverables, uh, but equally valuable to me is uh, my staffing profile for the schedule and uh, how, how many people will be working per week, per task, per category of, of people. So, uh, you know, include your major like deliverables and milestones, uh, but then for each one category of resource, I'm sorry to use that word, and then don't forget to include project management, of course. And, uh, and just say for all of those things, here's uh, how, what this given person will be doing that week. And uh, we typically throw in 20% for project management. Some, sometimes it's less, but usually it's more. Uh, it, it's something we usually run over on, uh, but that's a good compromise. And uh, I also want to point out something that you probably know. So has anyone here worked on a, on a $500 website, top to bottom? <laughs> come on, come on, don't be shy, don't be shy. Uh, has anyone here worked on a $50,000 project? Okay, getting warmer, look at this. Anyone worked for a $500,000 project? Okay, about a quarter of the room. Anyone worked here for a $5 million project? Okay, just one guy. Uh, so, I mean, we've done all of these uh, for the $5 million. It wasn't evolving up who's the prime, but we're definitely an important part of that project. And I can tell you uh, that sometimes... If you look at the end deliverables, it's hard to tell if it costs five million or five thousand. In fact, the five million dollar projects look like they—you wouldn't want to pay five hundred dollars for it because it looks like garbage, and uh, because it's political, right? So the same nominal deliverable, if you budget it differently for different organizations and their goals and expectations, it'll be structured differently. It's not the same deliverable because people might spend like a thousand hours per, per month in meetings. I mean, this happens in government projects all the time and it's normal because that's how government needs to do business. Uh, or I have, a, I have a friend who just took a job at the Veterans Affairs uh, and I think he spent the last four weeks writing a utility to run unit tests on every commit, you know, something that we get for free with CircleCI. And they have an open source solution, they didn't have that. So they were super happy with him billing, I don't know, like a couple hundred hours just on this little utility that's gonna make their whole multi-year project more efficient. That'll never fly for most of our clients. So this is uh, important to, to be on the same page. And another concept from, from estimation I'd like to touch on is uh, this idea of a cone of uncertainty. 
So when you when you just get an RFP or you get a lead, a, a voicemail that says, "Hey, uh, Franz, call me back. I, I I might need a new website." You know, <laughs> you might Google the, the name of the guy or the phone or the woman and the phone number to see what organization he's from. You look at their existing site and and you'll make assumptions as to what they want. And you'll talk to them. You know a little bit more. Then. Or RFP sometimes are Yeah, or the RFP, it's the same thing. Uh, and you have a list of questions in the RFP. Then you're going to go sit down and you're going to make assumptions around those list of questions and you can put that in your, in your proposal. And, and those assumptions may half line up with what the client had in mind and half not. Then the project starts and you, all those assumptions, uh, after a price has often been settled uh, and a schedule has often been settled, then if you start a discovery phase where you start questioning those assumptions and it turns out at least one third will, will be discarded and replaced by something else, but hopefully it was an unbiased estimate, so you're not too far off. And then, uh, so you're, you're getting warmer and then once you start actually uh, writing the specs and you wrote the specs and you did the design, uh, then you kind of maybe know, you think you know 75% of what this project is going to consist of. But then uh, your developer starts working and starts building out your content types and reusing all the existing code that already exists. And it turns out that no, all the, that code that you're going to assume you're going to reuse is not reusable at all because that was Drupal 7 and this is Drupal 8 or this is multilingual. Or, uh, so, so then uh, when you start development, you kind of get visibility in that process. And then obviously as development goes on and you're into QA, then it starts tightening down. But at the same time, when you hit QA, you, the client will come back and say, oh great, my boss, now that the site looks like it's done, my boss finally took a look at it, which he never really saw the design despite the fact that he signed off on them, and now we want design changes and we want all these extra features that uh, we don't have on our existing site. I mean, we're put in the RFP, but we can't launch without them. So uh, so this is this is the idea of this cone of uncertainty. And so, and so it's okay. It's actually okay to do estimation when you don't know. A lot of uh, developers who are like logically minded robotic creatures, you know, feel very uncomfortable with this uncertain world. But this is the reality that we're in. We all don't know. At every given time, we find out more and more and more. And we just do our best to estimate based on any information we have. And uh, how do we, in, in real world, uh, uh, deal with this cone of uncertainty? We actually uh, put the most defined, easy, reusable, non-negotiable tasks in, in that phase one. Phase two is the stuff that we the client would like to have, but they haven't quite given us enough information. And phase three, or whatever it is, you slice it up how you want. Phase right. three are the things that uh, speculated. Next, <laughs> next project maintenance. We'll do it as part of ongoing maintenance after launch, and uh, and so then we jiggle things. So so we actually the way we hit our estimates is, is it's it's not because we are so amazing at estimating, but because the estimation process doesn't stop when the estimate is done. We redefine the project scope at every single step to make sure that it still fits. Uh, all great project managers do it. I mean, and clients are happy when you do it and they're very unhappy when you don't. So that's, uh, that's a life lesson. And then there's a very important rule in uh, software estimation, which is the first 90% of the code accounts for the first 90% of development time and the last 90%, sorry, 10% 10, 10 of the code accounts for the last 90% of development time. So it adds up to 180, that's, that's the rule. Um, so I have uh, I have some some software estimation checklist, but I think I'm I'm running low on time. We'll come back to it. Okay. And uh, there's another book I, I don't have it here because I lent it to a friend like years ago, and I guess it's not a friend because they didn't give it back. Uh, it's called The Myth of Man Month. Anyone anyone heard of it? No. It's a, it's a very classic book in software engineering. It's from the '70s or something by the by uh, Fred Brooks, who was leading IBM System Two developments, their operating system and. Uh, and so he was. He had like 500, 1,000 developers under under his team, and it was a huge, monstrous project for for one of the ma major enterprise operating systems. And he he formulated what he calls the Brooks Law, which is uh, adding manpower to a late software project will only make it later. And he has charts about people communicating and meetings and number of, like email CCs and BCCs. Uh, he also talks about uh, the fact that when you have a small team that's a clear responsibility, there's going to be a visionary who is re like the quality control, the architect, like the designer, like who, who owns the, the functionality. Whereas when a project grows, that gets diluted, there's conflicting uh, visions. And so and he saw it in his real life work. Uh, he defines the term of man month, which was very popular back in the, in the 70s planning days. And he says it's not very useful, but... Uh, hence the mythical man month. And uh, he, I also remember him talking about a se second system effect, which I already mentioned. You know how he said, post-launch, all those lovely things you want, we're going to do them post-launch. So it turns out that in his experience, the first phase that was a beta prototype always, every project, 
And that went fine. It went over budget, but it went fine. We launched it. But actually, the big failures of his career were the second system. It's the time when you get to the, okay, and now we're going to do everything we wanted. And so that's the one that, like, you kind of use this trick of let's stay focused and just do the bare minimum and see what we get. So that's, uh, that really killed. So with that, I will uh, hand it over to Kevin. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I haven't had coffee, so I'm going to slow it down a bit. <laughs> uh, so we talked about estimation, and, and uh, Alex has given us a bunch of different techniques. And I think what Franz and I want to focus on is this idea of the range. And so the range is where you're going to provide a high and a low estimate for a particular project or a particular task. And hopefully you feel 90% confident that it's going to fall within that, within that range. Yeah, good timing. Good <laughs> Um, so we're gonna we're not gonna spend too much time, but just basically uh, just to just to throw this out there, um, these are like just an idea of ten different things where you have absolutely no idea how to estimate them, and so usually if we had a little bit more time, we'd say as an example, Annika, you could try what do you think is the surface temperature of the sun? You're gonna try to come up with some different uh, maybe some logic or something. So and come up with a range. How about we do something like if uh, everyone pick one okay. and then take a note of what would be the range that you think this is in? Great. Just pick ten. one or two if There's you're feel, feeling like it. Okay, wait, this, guys, table one, remember, table two, table three, yeah, table four, table, table, table five, table six, table seven, table eight, table nine, table ten. You guys in the back, you gotta pass. <laughs> Uh, so there's so 10 table tables. One. Table one. Table one. Uh, can, you, okay. can you all take a second? You don't have to talk to anyone. <laughs> can you confirm amongst yourselves and, and answer your question? No Google, please. Remember to use a range, right? Yeah. So, so now with the information that we have, the head person of the table, which is defined to be the person sitting closest to the aisle, will give you two numbers. So, guys, I need you to raise your hand. It doesn't matter what they are. Table one. Surface area, uh, temperature of the sun in Celsius or Fahrenheit. You don't care. 100,000 <laughs> degrees Celsius. To what? Okay. To how much? Yeah, I said Kelvin. It's the same. <laughs> 500,000 degrees. Okay, 500 K. Great. Okay. Second question. Latitude of Shanghai. Degrees. Zero to a thousand. What? Zero to a thousand. Oh, oh yeah. good. Yeah. Table three. Uh, you, you didn't actually get it right, but... Oh. <laughs> I think so. Table three? I think we would say one-tenth of the area oh, of the event. Uh, no, 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 it has to be a range. It has to be a range. I, I guess one-tenth. So okay. I would have to, to look at the event uh, area. But yeah? So I don't know if it's... So five, I think it's 500 million kilometers, so I don't know. 500 million? Feet, you know? 50 million? 50 million, okay. 50 yeah. million to 51 million? <laughs> no. uh, maybe uh, between 40 and 50 million. Good, okay, good. Uh, next one? Table four? Uh, Alexander the Great's birth year. 500 Yeah, sure. To zero, to zero. BC, BC. 500 BC to zero, okay. Okay, next. Right. next. Uh, between 100 trillion and 500 trillion. What's okay. the thing? Uh, volume of the Great Lakes? What? No, no, the no US, US currency. currency. US currency. Oh, okay, now that's clear. Okay. Pennies, pennies. Okay. That's, a, that's a trick. You can say if you want to add. Oh, no, yeah. Yes. Okay, uh, table. Oh, table six okay. is only KB or? One, sorry, 100 trillion <laughs> to? Are we talking in liters here? It doesn't matter. We have answers for both, yeah. Okay, table six. Table six is the uh, total volume of the Great Lakes. Uh, I don't know. So, like. 50,000 liters to like 500,000? <laughs> 50,000 liters, okay, 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 50,000 liters, okay. That's what happens when you have one person doing that. <laughs> yeah. That's a good lesson, guys. That's a good lesson. Uh, table it's 7 best. is the uh, Titanic uh, box office receipts. No booking. Are you a team? <laughs> uh, Did no, you look? No. Is that what you're looking at? No Google, no Google. Did you um, Google it? I don't think we reach consensus internally, but I'll say what I think. I, I thought it was like... 40 to 50,000 kilometers. Uh, what? No, what Titanic. Titanic. It was oh, Titanic. Titanic. We did the wrong one. <laughs> <laughs> That's another valuable lesson, guys. Okay? Read the RFP. Titanic, please. How much, how much money did Titanic Worldwide make? Worldwide box office receipts for receipts for the Titanic. How much, how much ticket sales? Um, 150 million. Two? Okay. Two? That's the low, right? Yeah. <laughs> And this okay. is tickets or dollars? No, dollars. Okay. okay. Next one, table, was that table seven? Table seven. Length of coastline? Is that table eight? 
Okay. Eight, eight, table eight. Table eight. eight. Pacific Ocean. Pacific Ocean. $30,000. Okay. Okay. Table nine is the number of book titles published in the U.S. Since, since 1776. Okay, let's say uh, 100 million. 100 million, okay. Minimum. And Minimum, up to? Uh, a billion. Okay, okay. And then the heaviest blue whale ever recorded, uh, table 10. Uh, before, no. <laughs> so uh, we said 5 to 10 tons. Okay. How much? Five to ten tons. What's a ton? A ton, a ton, a ton is a thousand kilos. A thousand kilos. Okay, 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 okay. I'd okay. say one or one or two kilo whales, and it's fine. <laughs> okay. Can we show the answers? answers now? Yeah. Okay. So, here okay. we go. So, Alex, how so many? I, let's see. The first one we said a hundred, a hundred to a hundred to five hundred. Wrong. Celsius. Wrong. They were really wrong. Wrong. Uh, we said zero to a hundred, very savvy. That you got thirty-one, so that was good that they had a wide range. You got it's, it's, uh, it's, it's north and south, eh? Yeah. So yeah. you mess up. You mess up. Yeah. Yeah. And also, there's not two hundred degrees. Uh, next, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, guys, guys, please, no, no talking. It's going to be very difficult for this presentation. Okay, so uh, area of the Asian continent. Uh, the answer is seventeen million square miles, or forty-four. A million square kilometers, and we said 40 to 50 million square kilometers. Wow. Wow. Uh, that so next one, uh, Alexander the Great, no, 4, 500 BC okay. to 0 AD. You got it in there. Great job. It's too big. Uh, 100 uh, million to 500 million was uh, for the currency. No. Sorry, billion? No. No, that was the. Uh, that was really off. Way off. Way okay. Off. okay. There's triple projects that are bigger than that. Don't judge us. <laughs> okay, the next is uh, 50k to. Uh, no, we, we swapped the order. 150 million to 250 million. We were a little bit off. A little bit off. For Titanic, uh, we're off, yeah. Yeah, and then for the Great Lakes, we're off on that too. We well, had, I, I said uh, in liters, I don't know cubic kilometers. <laughs> but you're way, 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 and then heaviest blue whale, we said five to ten tons. So right now, uh, five, 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 okay, so you got two rights. You got two rights. Two rights out of ten. Okay. Two right out of ten. So I hope so that, that teaches you all a lesson about how we're all expert estimators. Uh, <laughs> exactly. That's so, true. so Ken, please continue. Oh, absolutely. Just, just to say that because this comes from this, uh, this book, and so they had given this survey to six hundred people, and only two percent were able to score eight, uh, eight or more correct answers. And, we're and most. Right here, right? We are right here. We're right so here. We're, we and are most, average. So we're, we're just average guys. <laughs> and so most of the people uh, were between one and three correct answers. And the, so the sort of the takeaway from this is that even though you feel 90% confident, you're actually 30% confident. Yeah, so we do estimates without doing research. Right, exactly. But, um, but the point is we're getting a range, so you could have made your range bigger to encompass that. That's the idea. Yeah. Of course, right. if you can have more research, you can decrease your range, but it's the oh, same yes. thing. But that's the same thing. If you have uh, research and information, you could try to make a uh, smaller range and still be off. I think the point of this exercise is also to be mindful of without doing sufficient research uh, and without being cognizant of how little you know, you're going to have pleasant surprises at the end of your project. Mm -hmm. So, good. Thanks. Uh, very quickly, we'll just t touch on this very quickly. It's another uh, estimation technique called planning poker. And um, so basically, let's say you have a, a project that you want to estimate. You have a series of, of uh, user stories in your backlog. And then you'll have a team of estimators and hopefully one representing each department. So let's say one representing UX, design, development, uh, project management, QA. Each one of them will get a stack of cards with these different types of numbers. And then what you're going to do is the product owner is going to read a user story to you and describe to you all the requirements and the business requirements. And then each person on the team will choose one of these numbers. Let's say these are just for now, let's call them story points. It's a point system. And then you, each estimator will choose one card based on what they feel is the level of complexity for that particular user story. And they don't show anybody else. 
So each estimator will take the card, and then when they choose their card, they put it face down, and then when everybody's ready, the product owner will say go, and then everyone reveals their card at the same time. And what you're trying to do is you're trying to get consensus among your whole estimation team for a particular, let's say, a particular range or an exact figure, and then uh, you have a discussion with your group as to, let's say, for instance, let's say four of you picked a three, but one of you had picked a 13, then it's up to you to have a discussion with everybody in the group to say, well, why did you feel that this user story is much more complex, whereas everyone else felt it was kind of like low complexity? And so the idea here is that the estimation group reaches a consensus uh, using these cards, and then uh, you take another vote again until like until everybody tends to agree is it going to be more towards a three or more towards a five or the 13. And so the, the advantage of, of not showing your cards is that you don't bias anybody because because if the first person to show their card first, you might be influenced by their opinion and then maybe change your estimate based on that. So that's uh, just very quickly to talk about planning poker. Um, and uh, I think uh, a lesson out of there is that it's good not to estimate in hours, and uh, because it's not realistic that it's hours, it won't be. So at least this is more honest that it's relative complexity of this task versus another task, and then you could say, well, we'll take three big tasks and ten small tasks. That's a more realistic approach than than trying to say, well, according to this thing, uh, it says it's going to add up to twenty. My dad does do this to me all the time. Uh, this is going to all adds up to twenty four hours. So why don't we tell the client it's going to take twenty four hours? And I'm like, ah, uh, to me, it seems like a 200-hour project, guys. So let's let's not do that. So when you have points rather than hours, it's a little bit more honest that way. Okay, uh, we don't have a. We're going to do this very quickly, Alex. But basically, um, we just wanted to do a little exercise again with you guys. So now we're not talking about oceans or Titanic or whatever. And this is like an actual uh, request, an actual request from the client. So basically, if you, if you can imagine a product catalog page and uh, a standard one, and of course uh, with uh, Drupal 8. And it's going to have all of these requirements given to us by the client. So imagine that you're going to have this page with a bunch of products, card style. Each card must list name, description, tags, product type. There's going to be multiple product types that to choose from with different fields. And then in the search, you're going to be able to either match it uh, exactly with the SKU number, or one of these search filters. And then the filters are going to be by main business unit, by product type, or tag words. And then uh, when you first arrive at the product catalog page, we want to show you all the results by default. But then as you start clicking on the different filters, uh, we're going to use Ajax to refresh the results uh, on the spot. And then the other thing, the other technology piece, is to use solar. So we're just going to give you maybe like one minute, since most of you uh, have experience with this to maybe just give us an estimate, uh, a range for front-end development and back-end development. And you can use the tables to, to discuss among yourselves. Okay, so uh, yeah, we, yeah. So basically we spent, uh, was it 28 hours front-end and 75 back-end yeah. for that. So it doesn't include PM, doesn't include QA, design, or UX, but that's just a straight-up development work for that. Uh, so the total that we, we logged in our system was 105. 105, 105 yeah. But the thing that we should be estimating, therefore, to, if, he, if the client asks us for a single commitment number, that means we should have probably given a range. Done No. Uh, if, he, if they ask for a single number, which is often the case, probably want to go to 125 to 150 for the dev, and then you start adding uh, all of the PM, design, QA, deployment, revisions, and so on. And then you probably will tell them 200 to 300. Uh, and, uh, and this is with the benefit of hindsight. And then you might even give them some extra work if you come in under, which, which yeah. happens some of the time. OK, Great. So, so one last thing before I move to Nick. What was the biggest uh, problem that you encountered in this project, like, like the search? Well, I think the, the solar, the, the solar, solar configuration. I the solar say, configuration was. I was probably yeah. the most problematic. I would yeah. think, right, for this part. So, so the biggest. There was some back and forth, uh, not understanding exactly what we needed to do for the solar, and then uh, we had to go some back and forth with the client to, to get that right. It was not super complex, but there was some misunderstandings. What's the range of hours? The range of hours I originally estimated forty to eighty for back end, and then forty to sixty to front end. Right. And, so and we were that, that solar part. Um, well, the the whole back end was seventy five, 
Okay. But how about that? You can remember how long the solar part was? The solar part, I don't remember exactly the solar part. Like once you make your search, do you go, do you have a link to go to see a detailed page of the product or something like that? Like you Did this? Once you get the results. No, that was, not, you, no, that was not part of it. Just, just a page. No. Just a page. Uh, for the solar, do they want like uh, autocomplete or uh, synonym or just... Is it auto-suggest? There was an auto-suggest. Was that in uh, slides? Maybe? No, it's not. Did we in, miss it? It's not in the slide, no. That, that should have been listed though, because that adds extra complexity to, to test and extra modules to install. Yeah. yeah. No, we did have an exact gotcha. match search for uh, SQ. Okay, but it doesn't mention the auto suggest on the uh, on the search field. Right? Okay. It's okay. Any any questions, guys? Yeah. Alex. In, in case you're interested, like we do estimation almost completely different. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Next year. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure there's so many ways of. Yeah. So we basically estimate based on uh, value delivery. So this is more on like feature delivery and like you know solar implementation number of uh, number of this and that right which aligns nicely to fixed price uh, fixed scope right um, we're much more like agile in terms of how we estimate so we extend agile not just to software development but also to the estimation process where we'll look at um, initially like you know, the, the code of uncertainty, right, at the initial stage. We'll look at like the theme level and we'll look at the, the epic level. And then we'll estimate the value associated with the theme and the epic level based on heuristics of, of doing similar things in the past and also like um, uncertainty on those levels, right? Um, so the, all the estimations are based on that value delivery, right, because an epic is always a statement of value delivery. Um, rather than the specific... How long it takes, yeah. Yeah, so we work off of a backlog that is low fidelity, and then we refine that over a period of time with the client uh, to get the higher fidelity, but then the scope always has to be variable. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, if you're practicing agile, the idea is that um, although the scope is variable, the product is going to be better, even if you don't complete everything. So it's just a different way of looking at the agile, or sorry, at the estimation process from more of an agile perspective. Yeah, and I, and I would say that we do this implicitly. We don't have a process for it. This yeah. is the start because it serves us like a base of what things cost us almost. Right. And then we implicitly will validate, well, does this make sense to even propose to the client this many hours for this kind of work? Yeah, it was good. So, like so we, we always do that analysis that you're describing anyway, and yeah. it's absolutely necessary and we should create a process for it that we haven't yet so maybe we'll go to your talk next year yeah, yeah. any any other uh, questions or comments the the one comment I had, sorry um, was that I noticed that you had a little like, kind of but it thinks the one thing that I find that usually is just a lot in a lot of projects is production pushing I mean like yeah. getting an actual production and then any hyper care or you know like warranty period that comes afterwards yeah. and I think that's always an important thing because we always put it as an afterthought but it costs us money yeah, we often put like 100 hours or something for post-launch post, yeah, post -launch, uh, warranty and goodwill budget. Question over there. Yeah, how do you estimate the QA and the PM value? Percentages? Percentages, yeah. Uh, I think we're using, and in that, in that tool in particular, there was, uh, I believe, 15 for QA and then 25 for PM. Your presentation. Okay, Any last question, folks? Good. Good. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.